Welcome to the last backstage of the year. And we could not ba dedicate this backstage to one of the great protagonists of Alfa Romeo. So, almost on the anniversary of his death, which was yesterday, we want to talk about Giuseppe Luraghi, who was the president of Alfa Romeo. The president, one of the great names which allowed Alfa Romeo to be what it is today and what it represents in the history of the automobile world. There's many ways to tell the story of this character, but first of all, I would like to welcome our guests. First of all, Chiara Luraghi, who is here with us today. Thank you for being here, Chiara Luraghi. My name is Chiara. I am the third daughter of Mr. Luraghi. And I'm the third out of five children. And I didn't follow the career of engines and automobiles of my father. But I drive very well, I must say. But first of all, I followed the secret passion of my father. Well, not too secret, actually. Because hundreds of times he repeated, I would have liked to be a painter. And I became a painter. And he was also very strict as a judge with my paintings. And sometimes when I was working on watercolors, and you know, watercolors are spontaneous, light, happy, light-hearted. Well, my father was looking from behind my back and it almost looked like he wanted to show me how to paint. But I must say that in the end, he painted a lot. And many times people think that he painted my watercolors, even though I, I am more um, for oil on canvas. But probably there was sort of a fluid between me and him. Maybe because we had this passion in common, painting. So there was something that made us understand immediately with drawings. My father was not very talkative. But to write and tell what was painting, imagination, poetry, he wrote letters that I'm happy I have kept. Even when I was young and I probably didn't know what they represented. But now, now I'm 90. And I'm understanding what my father was, but I could not ask him things that I could have asked when he was here with us. So this is what concerns painting. The area that I followed, we will get back to it. Yeah, but I liked my life in painting. Thank you very much. I would like to introduce you Paolo Rossi, who is the curator of the Paolo Raghi archive. He knows the history of the man, the manager, and with him we will analyze his character. And connected from remote, we have Maria Laura Luraghi, the niece. Hello, Maria Laura. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to say hello to my aunt as well. I'm a fan of my auntie uh, Clara. I follow her a lot. I follow her uh, 
books that she dedicated to her nephews, to us, and that allowed me to know my grandfather under different facets, from different points of view. And I thank her for this, and I'm also thankful for being here with you today. Thank you for accepting to participate. Talking about Luraghi at the Museo Alfa Romeo means talking about a very long period, very rich in transformation, which can only be compared to the period of uh, Ugo Gobato management a few years before, before the World War, because the greatness of a manager is measured from many points of view, not only from the results obtained, that in the case of Giuseppe Loraghi are unquestionable. Alfa Romeo went from being a fabric almost destroyed by war uh, to become a great and prestigious automobile industry. Well, it was already prestigious, but the talent was transforming the positioning of the company without losing its identity and values. And of course, when you think about the beginning of this story, you also think about the car of the great transformation, the Giulietta. And we can launch a video. So an ideal of safety and power for Giulietta Sprint, then Giulietta Berlina and the Spider. New times had come and with greater purchasing power, the dreams changed. Here, you can see the Giulietta Sprint and uh, Robeo presented in a fairy setting that in Verona recreated an antique history. What is told in this case was not only the history of the factory, the company that changes its positioning and production, the Giulietta, will mean a lot. It will mean a changing the world of automobile, uh, hiring new staff, enlarging the factory, and building new factories, Arese, then Pomigliano d'Arco, the Balocco racetrack. But these were all objective results. What is I would say, more difficult to grasp, but from a certain point of view, is even stronger from the point of view of the push that this transformation gave the company, is that the Alfa Romeo was at the cutting edge, at the forefront, under, from many points of view, not only from the technological and productive one, but also from the point of view of managing its image, a connection between the company and culture, art, a different way of communicating. We've seen the Giulietta presented with actors coming down a helicopter in 1954. And also the idea of having a helicopter uh, was not something to be taken for granted or easy to put in place. And then here we see the even more famous presentation of Duetto on the Motonave Raffaello deck. So a, a communication a technique which was new, but all these elements cannot be considered random things happening, but they were determined by a vision, a mindset that had to come from the top. And in order to understand why there was this sensitiveness uh, that brought Alfa Romeo on a certain direction, I think we need to understand the person, the man, the mark that he left on the company that he was leading, and he was really leading. Usually, in our backstages, we bring documents, uh, archives, uh, videos, but there is such a quantity of material about Luraghi which is impossible to select a few to show today, because he was president for a very long time and he touched all the departments of the company. And what emerged, and I repeat, only with Gobato, it was the same, 
as a capacity of working on the macro and on the micro with the same readiness with which uh, he took uh, decisions for the company here the minutes of the board directors uh, set the decision of a new plant or a new project line so, but he also had letters on the micro personally sent and signed by Luraghi. For example, he appoints a consultant to buy the uh, land of Balocco. So you can imagine how a person of that tenure was not only involved in the macro decisions, but also in the micro decisions. He wanted to, left, to leave his mark also on small decisions, contacts with people. He wanted to be a real leader. He wanted to lead the company uh, also uh, from the marketing point of view. And this also led to have a, a certain innovative sensitiveness towards historic cars. You see here at the start of the first Mille Miglia celebration, which is now known as Mille Miglia Storica, which Alfa Romeo contributes to create. But let us not forget that when Arese uh, was uh, decided, the building of Arese uh, was decided to be built in 1956, when there were still some uh, cars uh, from Alfa Romeo that were sold very uh, cheap, there was the vision of a museum, of a company, so not a company which was a factory, but an area at the heart of the company in front of the managerial site intended and built as a museum, not as a warehouse only. And in those years, this was maybe one of the most innovative visions anticipating what would become normal for the several big industries. And all these aspects created intangible heritage of uh, Alfa Romeo made up of people. You see uh, Puliga, Busso, Luraghi, and Carlo Chitti here in this picture. And, and this represents another fundamental chapter that was reborn in those years. The sports commitment, which after the World Championship of Formula One was stopped and then came back through the uh, development of Auto Delta and what came afterwards. So. There was not a department of the company where he didn't leave a mark and where this mark uh, was not personal. So a direction that was very clear and very strong. And everything that he, he did and was done was also communicated. Uh, the quadrifoglio uh, and the house organs were relaunched, a new form of communication was launched. And the alpha, uh, and one of the columns of uh, Il Quadrifoglio was l'alpha vince, alpha wins. There was a list of the victories, but also a list of things that did this thriving company capable of leaving its mark in history and to lead the automobile world, which was transforming very rapidly. At this point, I would leave the floor to Pablo Rossi, who thought about the, how depicting, I would say, this character, but we also have the other guests, so you can go describing Mr. Luraghi. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Adizio and the Museum Alfa Romeo for this invitation, well, Mr. Adizio and his collaborators, because this is the best way to pay tribute to Luraghi, who passed away 30 years ago. Uh, this morning I was at the uh, Archivio Luraghi, uh, the archive held at the Bocconi University, and uh, we calculated that 95 years ago, Luraghi graduated at Bocconi University with a dissertation of commercial aviation. So, well, Ardizio already highlighted many of the aspects of Luraghi's story. 
But I wanted to talk about the beginning and then we can comment if you want a few pictures. November 1952, Direct, General Director of Film Mechanica. He was called by the President and the uh, Director General Deliri. At the time, they were not very diplomatic, they were very straightforward. So, he was told when he was appointed. Alfa Romeo represents a scandal of film mechanic because while other automobile producers in Italy gain a lot of money, ours is losing incredibly. Mr. Loraghi, if within one year, and I repeat, within one year, you will not find a remedy to this, we will have to close the factories. If you consider the era, 1952, it's a post-war period, you can imagine the social bomb that could have exploded on Milan by firing more than 6,000 people. So Luraghi had in front of him a company, uh, how could I say, which was a quality company, but which had some defects over for more than a decade since the end of the war, it had been working with aviation and engines. And then the peace treaty signed by Italy puts a stop on our possibility to realize planes, especially warplanes, engines, etc. So it was a company which produced anything and everything. The list of what Alfa Romeo produced is incredible. There were even cheap kitchens. But there were even a very good cars, 2000, 2006, etc., et which were produced at a lower scale, a few hundred they needed 2,800 hours of work to build those cars. It was something unthinkable of. The company somehow tried to make ends meet. Luraghi receives this ultimatum. He sees that the situation is very bad. And he uh, starts what would give birth to the Giulietta. Just to show you the tenacity of the man, while Luraghi uh, goes to Liri, his mother, because Liri uh, controlled Fin Meccanica. Fin Meccanica is not what Fin Meccanica was until yesterday, which is now called Leonardo. Fin Meccanica was the damp fill of. Uh, other companies. And he was told, uh, dear Luraghi, <laughs> new models, series, no, there's no money. So Luraghi found the money and looked for the money abroad in Germany, where he found Otto von Amerongen, a, a German constructor and man of finance who trusted this Italian man who wanted to transform this artisanal company in a, a mass production company. So Ardizio would, would say, yes, we already know these things, but where does Luraghi come from? Okay, here you see a picture, there's four children, I would say, who are they? This is Luraghi's family, the son, uh, sons and daughters of Luraghi, because the father died uh, and the mother died too. So what do these four children do? Something very meaningful. They're not put in a, a orphanage, but the woman that you see seated is a school teacher 
and she decided to take on this family. It is important to say that she was 17. Now, <laughs> girls at 17 have other thoughts. I I'm sorry to interrupt, but this was important. The future president of Alfa Romeo, you see him, is the boy to the left, together with his brother. They were so thin, they were called the uh, Cerini. Cerini are very thin matches. That's why, because they were so thin. A and these matches are easily broken. And then we have another image where you see Luraghi dressed with the military uniform together with a young lady who would become his wife. Maria Maddalena is her name, but somehow she was called Liliana. We don't know why. So there is a universe between the two pictures. Luraghi is a man who is very quick, he's impatient. His uh, physical structure didn't satisfy him. Okay, he started to train as a boxer. So he, he started boxing and then he met some good boxers. He would broke his nose, he would leave an incisor, which he would never replace, because it, he was very proud of that, because it was like a, a proof of being able to be on the field and fight. Luraghi was also somehow a snobbish, and I also told him, he said that he learned more from boxing than from Einaudi, referring to his studies of economics, because uh, uh, boxing, he learned to be a fighter. So we should not forget that he was a fighter and very quick, very quick. So simultaneously, he was in the army, but he, he was serving the army, but he was also studying. He was doing many things simultaneously. He also became the model of a, a famous sculptor of the time, Canonima. Chiara, maybe you want to add something about that. And he created a monument, which is still present in Turin. Yes, it is very true. It is a, a, a monument dedicated to the artillerymen. So this monument by Canova had been imagined with a lot of money as a huge monument, which should have been visible from afar. And the curious thing is that in the city of Turin, there's this person who will become the president of Alfa Romeo with a gun in his hands. And uh, he could not only serve the army, but he also did so many other things. He also had a tin of oil and colors. So once he seated on the uh, color palette and he came back to his colleagues, uh, soldiers, <laughs> very awkwardly, because it was all full of colors. But this 
monument had to be very glorious and my father had to be the model for one of the several characters of the monument. But people from Turin lowered their expectations and their offers because it was very expensive, so the monument became smaller. And we, the children, could not even find it ever, but we know that it's somewhere in Turin. So you would wonder, what, what are you showing a, an advertisement of uh, uh, food, light food, uh, to lose weight? But it's very easy. Luraghi started to work there. He was very modern and his dissertation was on uh, commercial aviation. Commercial aviation and then he also participated in uh, future uh, debates on the alternative uh, hot air balloon, uh, planes, etc. etc. But there was no place for him in the commercial aviation, so he started to work for this company where he gains some experience. And then, lately, he moves to a textile industry, always very tenacious only, and always very ambitious. And Luraghi always aspired to modernity. He wanted to be in his time. Probably he was also influenced by futurism, which took place uh, in that period. Uh, so Luraghi was born in 1905, the futurism would start soon after. But apart from this, he wanted to do something different. And this something different would bring him to work for Pirelli. But as Adizio said before, with Luraghi you have to pay attention because if you focus on the manager and the corporate leader, you go off track because he already had in him a strong artistic and literary ambition. He would have wanted to become a painter, but that was also a path which was forbidden, especially by the uh, family situation he described. And just to remember, Luraghi, my wife Maria Luraghi, is publishing a book with a series of watercolors of Luraghi in the second part of his life, when he had time to devote to painting. So he started immediately to write. He was a poet and then he would write a lot for newspapers and magazines. So in Luraghi there's a specific attention to culture, a very precise attention to fight the gap between the technological culture and the humanist culture. But horizons widen because you see in this picture is shot somewhere in Spain because the big boss of the Pirelli tires department saw this very talented young man and sent him in Spain in 1932 because they had to re light, I mean, give new life to the Pirelli branch of Spain. And apart from the political situation uh, in Spain, Spain was a very interesting battlefield on a financial point of view. Because on one side there was Pirelli with their tires and on the other side the uh, big American companies trying to conquer Spain and the European continent market. 
Very interestingly, Luragi in Spain continues to show his double nature of manager, but also of men of uh, cultural interests. He would make many friends. And then I would like to say that the uh, book that, will, that would always accompany Luragi's Don Quixote by Cervantes. And why? Because Luragi liked a lot this visionary character who doesn't want to surrender in front of reality. And Don Quixote, we know uh, how it ended, but another element is that Luragi became friend of one of the most important uh, uh, poets of the last century, Raffaele Alberti, and he would be the Italian translator of Raffaele Alberti. So he was also a translator, and you can uh, imagine this mix of culture, which was not uh, lived as an elitist thing, but as a needed integration of his everyday work that allowed him to get more and more in the surrounding society, understanding its dynamics, understanding its needs. And it was always a mix between getting to new managerial results, but always knowing the uh, battlefield uh, in a very specific way. And we should say that this also would also be linked to another element of Luragi, personal bravery. Okay, he was brave, he, he was a, a boxer, but personal bravery was born from the fact that Luragi, at a certain point, is in the middle of the civil war in Spain. It's 1936, the uh, civil war in Spain starts, he came back to Italy accompanying his family and goes back to Spain to try and save the managers of Pirelli in Spain, especially the Spanish managers who were risking their lives. So that's also a very important period. The picture that you see here is a picture that sees Luraghi back in Italy and Pirelli, you see to the left, there's a man with a hat and hands in his pockets, which is Alberto Pirelli and then Mr. Luraghi. And then what is interesting is that to the extreme right, you find Leonardo Sinisgalli. And uh, Ardizio uh, underlined the communication element before. And communication is a fundamental aspect in the corporate activity. But Luraghi chases literally this man because he appreciates him as a poet but also as a man of wit, of interest. Adriano Levetti is another competitor who takes Sinisgalli, but Luraghi uh, tries again, and Sinisgalli would become one of his team with a role which is not only the classical communicator, but the man uh, uh, who brought ideas and proposals. And with Sinisgalli, they will start collaborating with the magazines, first Pirelli and then Civiltà delle Macchine. Pirelli, of course, was the magazine of Pirelli, and Civita delle Macchine was the corporate magazine of Film Mechanica. And these two men completely overturned the classical cliché of communication. So telling uh, the general direction of a company, selling mm, a certain type of machines, for example, that they could not expose that machine to the fairs was like <laughs> swearing in a church, but Sinesgalli had other ideas, other proposals, the capacity of suggesting, well, of giving 
uh, subliminal suggestions evoking the reality that they had to express. A fun anecdote is that, well, you mentioned the Giulietta before. Now, we call this car a Giulietta, and it's something spontaneous, but in 1954, calling a car Giulietta was crazy. But there were these three men, Luraghi, Leonardo Sinisgalli, and Giorgia de Cusandier. But who is Giorgia de Cusandier? She was a baroness from French origin, but she was the wife of Sinisgalli. So, and these three were discussing the name of the car, and Giorgia de Cusandier said, Giulietta. I think it's a fitting name, young, evocative. So the proposal was passed on and that's why the truck would be called Romeo just to evoke the Shakespearean couple Romeo and Juliet it, it looks like a very fun anecdote but if you think about that period in that period the cars were 1500, 1800, 1200 but calling Giulietta a car was innovative and I think that the success of Giulietta was also given by its name because from the side of Alpha there was a strong awareness of the need of fascinating the customers and involving them so uh, Alizio please uh, uh, stop me no 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 uh, what you're saying is very interesting because Giulietta was born with the name Giulietta but then it would be called in many other ways first of all uh, the colors that for the first time is Azzurro Spazio, Giallo Pererino, Acqua di Fonte, Rosso Corallo, Coral Red which was before Rosso Pomodoro Chiaro so all these colors have names which represent a different way of expressing the object to the uh, public so less technical and more lifestyle closer to the people but then there was a study behind this Alfa Romeo uh, charge Iole Veneziani one of the greatest fashion designers of Milan in that period to uh, draw the colors to Christ them <laughs> to give names to the colors it was a completely different way of approaching the world of automobiles which started from the name Giulietta and everything revolving around it so you can continue yes, we can continue with these pictures okay so here you see uh, Luraghi smiling the man sitting is a fundamental person in the life of Luraghi together with Giuseppe Benosta who hired Luraghi this is Cesare Merzagora Again, a name that maybe you would not know today, but he was a great uh, corporate man. He led Pirelli between the 30s and the end of the war. He would become a, a um, politician later on. He would become very important. He would become president. Uh, I don't remember whether it was the Senate. Anyway, one of the highest positions of the state so the two collaborate strongly there's a strong sensitivity towards the same themes a specific attention towards production and the product and also personal courage which unites both of them why am I saying this because Marzagora maybe too bravely during the resistance directs the uh, economic committee of northern Italy from his office in Corso Matteotti which at the time was called Corso Vittorio and Luraghi was one of his uh, close collaborators so somehow oh, mm, another manager who probably 
didn't like them or was jealous, sent an anonymous letter to the Germans saying that uh, subversive activities were hold, were held there, but this letter was intercepted by an Italian soldier who came to them and said, well, I intercepted this, but it would have been the end for you if this arrived to the Germans. So the two understand the risk that they were running. The man who wrote this letter was identified because he was using the typing machine of his secretary and he was informed that if something would happen to them, he would finish his career. And so this person resigned and track was lost about him. But in the end, Luraghi asked to this man who found the letter to this policeman uh, if he wanted something in exchange, and the answer was very simple. This policeman had a son at the Polytechnic, uh, the University of Milan. He would graduate after a couple of years, and if they agreed, he would have sent his son. If the son was talented, they could hire him. Otherwise, no, but that was the case. So it's another anecdote proving again the courage of two people that instead of disappearing took the situation in their hands. So this is the first e issue of the Pirelli magazine. So when Ruraghi insists for this magazine to be published, Alberto Pirelli sets a condition that the possibility <laughs> that they will set the, the base for having a magazine for at least one year. If I'm not wrong, 38 years. It, it lasted 38 years. And this is Civiltà della Macchina, the magazine of Film Meccanica. In both magazines, Luraghi, Sinisgalli, but also other friends would work together to do many things. And again, maybe a Chiara has some memories or anecdotes about this. What did they do together, Chiara? A publishing house? Yes. With his friends, which are Mucchi, who not only created the logo, but was also super elegant. And Sergio Solmi, who arrived at our place every now and then to pay a visit, and they discussed about this. So my father said, Italians are all poets, but you have to pay a lot of attention because in a moment when Montale, Quasimodo who were famous after being very poor they arrived at celebrity level, Sergio Solghi, Mucchi, Cantatore, who was one of my masters, Carrieri, Vittorio Sereni. Well, a group was formed which not only read the poems that arrived very numerous, And then some names really became important poets. 
of the last century. I have an anecdote to tell you of Solmi. Solmi sunk in his armchair as if he fell asleep, so he was thinking about this stuff. So usually at our uh, house, after dinner, these people arrived, but Solmi once arrived before dinner. And there was nothing in the fridge that day because the next day was the day when my mother was going to do the grocery shopping. So she was terrified, but she remembered that the tripes were still in the fridge. So, she was disappointed, but she wanted to warm up these tribes. But once we ate and everyone arrived, each one had his seat. And uh, everyone had favorites, of course, and friends. Sergio Solmi fell asleep and he lost an entire evening. <laughs> but the tribe of Solmi remained one of the titles in our family of fun anecdotes. We can continue with photographs. Here you can see Luraghi in Moscow. And that's not by chance because the head of in Meccanica in those years started a strong politics of internationalization of in Meccanica. And he was also going to Moscow to try and sell products, cars, etc. A characteristic of the negotiations of the time was that uh, Russians, especially people from Moscow, were welcoming, friendly, etc. But you had to drink a lot of vodka with them to celebrate the successes of uh, Soviet communism. So they benefited from this, hoping that Luraghi <laughs> would get high. But Luraghi didn't drink a lot, but he could drink vodka and not, uh, without getting high, so uh, the negotiations were very balanced. So we talked about the uh, journalism activity of uh, Luraghi, who wrote for many, many years on Tempo, which was a weekly magazine. This is an editorial meeting of his successo. And you can recognize several masters of journalism around the table. Started from Tofanelli, Vigorelli, etc. Here we talk about well, before we talk about uh, Luraghi's friends, here he was with Alberti, a Spanish poet. He translated Luraghi with Vittorio Sereni, who worked in these editions of Meridiane, where Luraghi said, during the day, we make <laughs> money, our salary, and at night we spend the money and we lose our salary with our publishing endeavors. This was a group picture, a night at the house of Luraghi, you see Raffaele Alberti in the forefront, Motti, Sinis Galli, Cantatore, to the left, so a group of friends who like to talk, but especially the most important thing 
as Ardizio said, is that this was not an elitist culture, but it was a culture where you exchange ideas, suggestions, indications, also to be able to speak to the wider possible audience with a greater capacity also of doing a successful entrepreneurial activity. So the cultural activity of Luraghi should always be considered with this ambivalence, which also had the advantage to combine the humanist culture to the technology and career. This picture is emblematic today, talking about fashion is very common, but at the time it was very different. And you see a nice Alfa Romeo with a, a model of Germana Marocelli, who was a famous seamstress of the time. It was one of the first attempts to widen the horizons a convey a concept of elegance of a car. So involving not only the car, but also the daily life of people. We can continue with the pictures. We see here Luraghi. In a, a social moment, I would say, with great champions, you of course know who that smiling man is at the center of the picture. We dedicated a backstage to him at the beginning of the year. I hope that our audience recognizes the man. And this picture hides an anecdote because Luraghi chose to withdraw Alfa Romeo from Formula One. It looks like a, a difficult decision but I won't tell you what happened also in politics because he was also called by De Gasperi who was urged to have Alfa Romeo participate in the Carrera Mexicana but that was a, a specific uh, entrepreneurial and corporate decision the company was not so big and stable and could not spend energies on two areas which were different. On one side the agonism and on the other side the production, the mass production. Then things would evolve, Autodelta would be born, etc. But Ardizio and the Museo Alfa Romeo know these things better than me. Yes, it was a very difficult uh, situation. There's a lot of letters and exchanges in order to try objective reasons to withdraw the uh, agonism department. A very uh, deep analysis was done on the changes or norms that put uh, the Alfete out of the game, the cost of design of the new cars, uh, the return on the investment, and in if it could beat Ferrari was a competitor. So in the end, trying to avoid what Gobato uh, defined uh, reasons for distraction 30 years ago, which is the races, prevailed. This is an emblematic picture where Gianni Agnelli and Luraghi met, and then there's Nola Di Bardini and other heads of Alfa Romeo. This is a, 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 an iconic picture of hands that in the end hided a fierce competition. And this is a moment of celebration. Giulietta reached 100,000 cars and Giulietta Masina was called to celebrate this moment uh, just because she was called Giulietta. So someone from the communication, maybe Sinesgalli, 
organized this moment of communication and uh, celebration. And as I said about the communication, there was a certain attention to celebrities, etc. Giulietta Masina, if you don't know, was the wife of Federico Fellini, one of the uh, greatest directors of Italian cinema. But Luraghi was a great innovator and pioneer. He wanted to have the company grow, was inspired by innovation and modernity. And you see here the small Alfa Romeo. It was an attempt that should have completed the uh, Alfa portfolio. But this project remained probably only a presentation, the presentation that you see, drawings. Uh, but the answer was there's no money, we have no possibility uh, to develop this. Instead, others say that maybe uh, there was money, but from Turin, someone said not to go into that area, but maybe it's just a gossip or a legend. Well, on the Vetturetta V, the V project, uh, we also had a, a conference. There were no official suggestions, but they changed direction very quickly. So we don't know. Uh, Luraghi in front of the map of Arese. So a moment when Alpha had to change pace because you can imagine a great a company, Portello, in a neighborhood of Milan, uh, was not the best. And just to uh, tell you in front of the direction building, there was a 32 tons a machine. Actually, it was a rammer. that was very noisy, so it was impossible to live there. But it, the, the choice of Arese was a difficult one. Well, it was difficult, but the choice of Arese, yes, was difficult, but Luraghi realized that the Portello could no longer coexist with the situation of Alpha, also because the Portello plant was actually divided in two by a, a road. So to go from one side to the other, we had to go through underground tunnels, which were built in the past, and it would become very useful during the war, for obvious reasons. And when Arese was built, five different uh, places were chosen, and it was very fascinating because everything was on paper at the time. So there's such a, a two-meter poster, but there's a survey calculating the commuting time of all the employees according to their seniority and position and the reimbursement. And this had their choice fall on a couple of these plants. And then the choice uh, went to Arese. But there was a, a long thought before choosing Arese. That is the famous Vetturetta that you saw before, which was like a dream. I, re I would step. This is a, the inauguration of the new uh, branch of Roma. The minister Giorgio Bocca is there, Luraghi, Bardini, and then to the left, the president of Finmeccanica. An important moment because it strengthened the commercial network, not only in Rome, but also in the rest of Italy. You should consider, and here, you have the image of Luraghi 
they like to be in the different departments to be there but thinking about Rome but Luraghi look with a lot of attention to Italy and to Italian network but he, he was very international but Alfa Romeo bought the Fabrica Nacional de Motores, which was an important Brazilian plant, and then expanded to all continents, uh, South Africa, where the CKD were sent. <laughs> but it was like a, a game, like Meccano, because you open the box and you assemble the cars. Uh, then we will see a picture of Loraghi with the a Ministry of China because you also looked at the Far East there was an international dimension integrated and then of course the United States which were one of the markets which were considered most important and the duetto almost became a, a metaphor or for Dustin Hoffman, etc. Well, the Fabrica Nacional de Motores will be uh, discussed in the future because at the end of the Second World War, Film Mechanica had a very swift operation. The Fabrica Nacional de Motores had a series of contracts with Dr. Fraschini, which then are taken from Zata Fraschini, which is sacrificed, and then given to Alfa Romeo, guaranteeing the survival and the capitals uh, and the, the operation of selling FNM to Fiat would be uh, as brilliant. But next year or in the future, we will also devote a backstage to this. So the history that we are telling, see, as a, a, a main track but then as thousands side parts and I hope that the Museo Alfa Romeo uh, will analyze them and, and I'm sure they will do that very well. What you see now is an overview of a project concerning Alfa Sud which was so debated and controversial So Alpha Sud, someone said, it was entering the world of the economic cars, but that was not true. When Alpha Sud was being born at 1200, was considered almost a big car. Now a 1200 is not. So at the time, it was almost a powerful car. And it was the entry point to become an alpha fan. Another thing is the plant of Pomigliano d'Arco. It was criticized because it was considered old, but it was very modern compared to other plants. And what today, even though many plants disappeared, Pomigliano d'Arco continues to be present. Of course, it is a new Pomigliano d'Arco. It's not the same as the Pomigliano d'Arco of the time, but it was built with certain criteria, apparently, taking into account the evolution of the production and its organizations. And the man who designed Pomigliano d'Arco was Rudolf Ruska, who was a, an Austrian specialized in the construction of innovative buildings because it was in his culture 
It was also what I studied for, etc. This is well, an article against Alpha Sur, but it was just a joke or polemics. And this is a very important moment. Luraghi greets Aldo Moro. Pasquale Saraceno is between them one of the most important Italian men of the South, and the smile of Luraghi. Maybe someone could interpret it as a formal smile, but in reality, that smile is like the conclusion of an evolution, which is very precise. When the Alpha Sud was still being debated and the construction was set uh, to be done in Naples, a lot of the areas of the original Campania were offered to Alfa Romeo, but Loraghi thought that the Alfa Sud had to be built by using the Alfa Romeo plant, which was already existing and which dealt with, uh, uh, produced in the past engines of planes and later on about components, but this plant had a big track Nuraghi insisted in using that land which was already a possession of Alsa Romeo. The politicians, of course, were against this. Aldo Moro, surprisingly, since everyone said that he it was hesitating and took time, put an end to the problem, saying the solution proposed by Alfa Romeo is okay. So I would say that that smile that we see in the picture, Luraghi smiling in Moro, was genuine. Here it is the moment of signing, of financing uh, for Alfa Sud. You see the uh, Centro Entrilla, Emilio Colombo to the right. And those smiles of the two politicians could be interpreted in several ways. To me, they are a little bit, there's a little bit of malice, like, okay, let's see how you will use this money that we gave you. This is an image that you can comment, uh, Mr. Ardizio, because you are an expert. This is one of the uh, nicest, uh, most beautiful images and most used images, even though we are in a, a later stage of Auto Delta. We see Teodoro Zeccoli, the test driver of Auto Delta, and this witnesses the personal commitment of Loraghi to bring back Alfa Romeo to the racetrack, not only through the customers, who had good successes, but also with an official team which could compete in all categories, starting from TZ and GTA, then 33, Formula One. It was an ambitious program which, uh, as a few years before the Ferrari had done, for reasons of swiftness, was given to a company which was an external company in the beginning and then was uh, acquired, which became the Auto Delta of Settimo Milanese. And it started working better than Ferrari, uh, getting great results. And uh, it, it was one of the things that fans love. That's why one of the 33 uh, models is present here today. in this room. And the same thing, it, well, there's another uh, photo here in Balocco, another baby of that period where you underlined the brotherhood between the racing cars and the world of production. This car was printed in 1970 with the slogan, the heart of the 33, for reasons that our fans know very well. But at the back, the 33 3 liters will be destined 
Tiremos el faromeo. Luraghi with Petrilli, president of IRI. And they uh, agreed and collaborated until the big Avellino plant case burst out. I talked before about Luraghi in China. Here he is with Chuan Lair, the Ministry for Exterior. Uh, they started negotiations. This is another view in this picture. It shows the passion Loreghi, Luraghi had for the idea of the Museo Alfa Romeo. And you see here another image so before the museum, when there was still a temporary one, before the opening of the Arese one, but with the car that he had bought going back to the origins. And at a certain point, it became like a treasure hunt. It was like, you know, when you collect stickers and you always miss one, when in the end they managed to put all the parts of the puzzle together, there was just one model missing that you could not find anywhere. So the anecdote is very curious. An engineer, collaborator of SATA, uh, was traveling, was on holiday with his family in Holland. And at a certain point, their children are thirsty. So the wife says, OK, there's a farm. Let's go there. And we will ask for a glass of water. So they go to this farm. And while the children drink, the engineer talks to the owner and this asks him, what do you do in your life? Well, I, uh, uh, engineer of Alfa Romeo. And the man says, oh, Alfa Romeo, I probably have something of Alfa Romeo somewhere, but where? He said, well, there in the barn, that's our old barn. So they go and with the stupefied eyes of this engineer, they found, well, this car, even though it was not in perfect conditions. And then this uh, engineer uh, called Italy, and what was left of this car was brought to Milan. And the technicians of Alfa Romeo tried to uh, fix it. Other pictures. Here we have uh, the presentation of the models to politicians. Here we see uh, Andreotti suspicious between Rusca and Luraghi. To the left, you see Tupini and Medugno, so the most important figures of Iri, and then again Fanfani. Where Alf, when Alfa Sud was presented, and here the final stage, Luraghi is all this president of Mondadori, but he is in Milan, he is near Milan. Again, this is Luraghi with the managers of Mondadori here at his desk of Mondadori in Segrate. And then we finish with what we were saying before. We would have liked to be a painter. This is the cover of the book which is coming out. There are a couple of uh, images as well contained in this book. So the mountains of Campiglio, the sea that could be the Sea of Diano Marina, or maybe the Lake of Garda, according to interpretation. So the places that were dear to Luraghi. Luraghi is no longer a manager. He doesn't have uh, managerial responsibilities. And 
he can spend time painting. So we talked about the modernity, the courage, the of communicating, but I would like, since we are at the museum uh, Alfa Romeo with your fans, I would like to ask to Chiara, uh, how <laughs> was Luraghi as a driver? Was he a good driver? Be honest. Well, from the outside, people thought he was a great Formula One pilot because he was driving super fast all the time, always with an eye on who was close to him because he didn't like people to overpass him. So when we stopped at the red light, we started breathing again because we knew that when the green light would start, like it, the, the start of the car would be so violent to be the first one that we would have stopped breathing again. I, I'm not used to talking with a microphone, I'm sorry. So it was so violent, the acceleration, that we went back. Pressed to the seat. He could not stand not to be in pole position. There's not a single picture of him driving in our archives, but probably this was the result of an agreement uh, of Alpha and the managers would never be shot driving cars because they were driving, of course, the Alpha cars and they were managers of Alpha and the times are very delicate. But my question is, was Luraghi an Alpha fan? He worked for many companies and he arrived at Alfa Romeo after other companies. But the real question is, in private, was he a real man of the company? I mean, did he really have a passion for Alpha? He was so kaleidoscopic that every year I write, some, when I'm not a writer, but I started writing more because I can uh, draw less now. So I wrote a book on my father. So uh, I just had 100 printed and I finished them. I had some reprinted to bring them here and I will leave a couple of books here, but the books are so heavy that I, I, I could bring only a few, but I have others at home and I will find the place and a way to send you books if you want one. But what was the question? <laughs> I think you, you didn't want to answer my question. No, what, what was the question? We talked about him as a driver. I really don't, under, don't, don't remember the question. No, my question was, was he really passionate about Alfa Romeo? Or, or, was it only a work or, or, or was he a fan? Yes, he was. I feel my wardrobes, not with clothes, but with other things. My father wrote so many personal things, intimate things, and Mr. Rossi at Bocconi University arranged 
Uh, how, uh, how is it called? Help me. El Bocconi? I don't know. I don't know the name. I don't know. How do you call those things? Did you said at Bocconi? I'm a painter. I don't know the name of those. And then in Pavia, you mean the Centro Manoscritti of the University of Pavia? The manuscripts and the archives are partly at Bocconi and partly in Pavia, the University of Bahia, Pia. Yes, and I was lucky enough or unlucky enough because I suffer sometimes to think about who I will leave these precious documents to and I filled my house with very intimate things, personal things. I also found memoirs. Uh, my father was very private, was a private person, and he didn't talk a lot. Okay, let's cancel my last sentence. So I reviewed all his stuff, even notes, and I found a poem which was not polished yet as to be published on the book because my father wrote four or five uh, books of poems and he thought about Dario, the father of Maria Laura, his last son, and he, he was his dearest son. I was, he was very affectionate to me from one side and to Dario from the other side, because Dario was a, a man after three women, so the son after three daughters, and he was the youngest child. And I read that he wrote this poem by comparing constantly Ferrari with Alfa Romeo because that was the question that this little kid was, kept asking him. And I liked this very, very much because in the end he said, no, the Alfa Romeo wins, always wins in a poetry. Can you imagine how nice this is? And Alfa Romeo wins, absolutely. You see, you, you talked about my father. About things that I, I don't know because I had another relationship with my father. I have beautiful letters. And many of the pictures and photographs that you showed, I didn't even know them. I've never seen them, so I was so interested. I saw in a picture that my father buttoned his jacket unevenly. So his jacket was all crooked and it was meeting important men. But when you will invite me to talk about my father as a painter, etc., maybe I will be able to say a little more. But there will be an occasion, I'm sure. Maria Laura, can you hear us? Yes, I'm smiling. I am smiling because it was a very wonderful afternoon listening to my aunt and uncle speaking. I have the quadrifoglio and Alfa Vince. So you have to talk about automobiles now. I have the Pirelli magazine. I don't know if you see it, but this kid 
is my father. This Pirelli magazine dates back to 1949. So all the anecdotes that I heard today, well, I heard them also from my father. I love the tenacity of my grandfather, uh, his generosity, and also when he was a model for Canonica, the sculptor, when my grandfather studied at night in order to keep up with the exams and he was chosen as a model, he could he could study at a Canonica's workshop because he didn't have a, a place. So he was really a, a great man and I'm very proud of him. Ardizio, we went now to a younger generation. Ke this is the son of Renzo Ruraghi. Talking with Pablo before coming here, we said, what, what could we say? And since the question was about the love of Giuseppe Ruraghi for the cars, and in particular Alfa Romeo cars, I can tell this story, which is quite a funny anecdote. I was 10, and in the summer we went to the Garda Lake, and once he arrived with this Montreal, which in the 70s was really an incredible car, an incredible line, beautiful. So I remember that that morning I woke up and I saw this car parked in front of the house of my grandfather and said, it's marvelous. And I was turning uh, all around the car and my grandfather, who was always busy, he had many things to do. But I didn't realize that he saw me. He, he saw me is around this car and said, Paul, do you want to... Uh, go somewhere with me on this car. So uh, I remember that he took the keys of the car and I remember that before driving, he put on his driving gloves with the perforations, without the, the fingers. And I remember the gesture to close the gloves with great care and I said what is going to happen because I know that it was driving very fast I was a kid and I remember that my gaze was very low and the Montreal had a very big dashboard and I remember that we went out of the driveway and my grandfather accelerated super fast as you said auntie I was back on the seat and the Montreal had a very long front and I was very little and I could see almost nothing and I remember this episode very, very well. And that is to say that he was a real passionate about cars and he also wrote about this. Yes, yes, because I was very struck by this. Thank you. Well, you, you can sit there and you can have a family picture, even though partly virtually. I would like to thank, first of all, my guest who accepted to come here to talk about personal things and paying tribute to Giuseppe Loraghi. who was responsible for us, Almeo, for the place where we are today. So it was important for us to uh, celebrate him before the end of this year, despite these two last years. 
I thank you. I thank our audience, the ones present here physically and those who are online. And then I want to show you as a last thing a video expressing the passion that today lives in the museum and in Alfa Romeo, a passion that was built in its history, values and strength, generating passion. Thanks again. I think that on behalf of uh, the family Luraghi, we should thank all those who followed our talk, but in particular Ardizio, the Museo Alfa Romeo, who wanted to combine a memory and a, a tradition with the activity of the museum. which has a great story and does a lot of activities. So, it's a heartfelt thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks again to everyone.